So we're back out in the uh, pollinator garden here. And I promised that we would do some videos on specialist pollinators. And it's definitely something that I've taken to heart a bit more and become very passionate about. So I figured that this will end up being like a more multi-part series, but I wanted to cover today 15 of the most important plants here in the Eastern United States for specialist pollinators. Now, for those of you who are tuning in from maybe the central or the Western parts of the United States, there'll be some overlap to these, but you'll have your own uh, top plants for where you are regionally speaking. And just because I'm highlighting Eastern North America, it doesn't even mean that these are the top plants for New York State, which is where I am right now. One of the most important families of plants is the Asteraceae. You know, some people would know them as the Aster family or the Composite family or the Daisy family. And this is what these flowers look like. So they'll often have these little ray florets and then the little disc florets in the center. In fact, you could actually see this better on this uh, sunflower right here. So you have these giant yellow rays. So those are the ray flowers. And then these are the little disc florets. So there's like an inflorescence on the inside as well. And those ray florets basically signal to pollinators, hey, come and pollinate me. And they actually act a little bit like bracts. Like, so if you think about Cornus canadensis or Cornus florida, our dogwoods, they have those like more colorful bracts that kind of bring the pollinator into the florets in the middle. That by far is a family that is the most impressive when it comes to specialist pollinators. And there's, you know, there's really a reason for that. It's because that is the second largest family of plants next to orchids. So if you think about all these specialist pollinators that have been emerging, you know, with these plants for tens of millions of years, I think the Asteraceae family is probably close to 90 million years old, they basically co-evolved together. And because they were so cosmopolitan, because they were so widespread, then these specialist pollinators basically, you know, co-evolved and took a bet, you know, if you will, to co-evolve with those uh, plants. So when we remove those plants out of our landscape, whether it's because we are developing it and removing the fields where the asters are, or um, because we're deciding on plants that uh, are non-native plants or cultivated varieties of plants, then some of those specialist pollinators then fall by the wayside. Now, of the 15 plants of the Eastern United States, 13 of them come from the aster family. And the first one of that is Soledago or goldenrod, which we could come over here because there's goldenrod everywhere. In fact, the most aggressive goldenrod that we have is Canada goldenrod. So you'll see it come here, but we have many different goldenrod species. So this is in the genus Soledago. <laughs> you could see one of these uh, aster groupings are here as well. So these are just naturally coming up and some people might consider these weeds but uh, you will find so many different types of insects on these Soledago if you look really close enough. So that would be uh, the number one. So number two is Helianthus. And that's, our, that's what we already saw, that's, that's our sunflowers. So those are all the sunflowers that our chipmunk and our birds planted. And those are some of those iconic plants and they are often crawling in pollinators. You don't see anything because we typically shoot in the morning. It's really cold and chilly in the morning and it really isn't to the height of the day that you see actually all the, the pollinators coming out. So Helianthus is number two. And then number three is the Symphiotrichums. These used to be called asters in the genus Aster, but they got moved over to Symphiotrichum. I haven't read the literature, but I'm sure because the aster family is so large, it probably got blown up and put into different genera. This is actually our native um, aster. So this is, I think, Symphiotrichum lavis. I need to get a really good aster key because a lot of our asters kind of look alike, but 
refused to actually mow this because this is some of our natural asters. And you can see that I actually have some cultivated varieties here. So we have this one, which is a, a bright pink. And it has been shown by Mount Cuba Center and a few others that sometimes our cultivated varieties actually don't attract a lot of pollinators. But these ones, I have seen quite a bit of pollinators. This is a little bit more of a low growing Symphiotrichum. You start to see it's a, some of it's, you know, appearing more towards the end of its life, but it has this uh, blooms for quite some time and at, at a time when it's like approaching winter. So these are really important flowers for some of our pollinators, both generalist and specialist pollinators. Then uh, I have this darker version right here that actually was in another garden, but I thought that you know, I had a red dahlia right here and it was too red. So I moved that to another garden and I switched this one out. I found one of our native Symphiotrichums. Where did I plant that now? Oh yeah, right here. So I kind of popped this one out of our meadow. And this is our New England aster. I really like this one, had a darker color leaf as well. So this will start to open up. As the sun opens, these little ray florets start to open up as well. And then this one has been great. I mean, look at how many, this is like drenched in, in, in like it just flowers. It looks like a snowbank, and that's how so many of the asters look like. They, they look like little snowbanks. So there's so much floral activity that happens on plants like this. So that is another important genus as far as specialist pollinators go. So the next one after that is Rudbeckia. We have some of that growing in our meadow. I don't actually have any of that growing here in the pollinator garden, but Rudbeckia is like the brown-eyed or the black-eyed Susans. So again, that's something that's in the aster family. And then the next one after that will be Chrysopsis. And I don't think that we have too many Chrysopsis that are native to New York specifically. The one that I could think of is the Maryland golden aster. And again, in the aster family, has it even in the common names. And again, you'll get that nice disc floret. And I do believe that I planted small plugs in here, so there's not going to be too much plant that I could actually show you. Um, and earlier in the tour, I also mentioned another genus, which is the next one on the list, which is Grindelia. And that was one that I was not actually familiar with. It's called curly cup gumweed, and it's often used uh, medicinally for skin issues. So if you have uh, poison ivy, for instance, that's one of the quote unquote cures for poison ivy is that curly cup gumweed. And we do have, I think one or two that are native to New York. So those were two plugs that I actually put in and made sure that we had here for some of our specialist pollinators. The next one on the list is Coreopsis. And we have quite a bit of that growing here. Now this is a cultivated variety of Coreopsis. So this is often called tick seed. Um, this is lanceolata because it has the lance-shaped leaves. I do have the native variety of Coreopsis in the yellow garden that we have over there. They tend to bloom much earlier, I noticed, than this one. And oftentimes when you have a cultivated variety, they bloom not necessarily when the native variety blooms. And that's really critical. Uh, if you want to attract specialist pollinators, then get the, the native species that's preferably native to your region, because a lot of those specialist pollinators only have a small window of opportunity that they could use in order to uh, sync up with pollinating that plant. So if you wanna go with the cultivated variety, fine, do that, do that, but make sure then you have that native species in your landscape as well. All right, so the next one on the list is Heterotheca. This was one that I was also not familiar with. So it's also called camphor weed. Now, again, this is something that's uh, popular for specialist pollinators within the Eastern United States. I do believe that we only have one that is native to New York and that's uh, the camphor weed variety. And the next genus after that is not in the aster family. So this is like one of the two that are not in the aster family and that's Salix. So some of you will recognize that that's our native willows. And I actually am not sure about the ones that are non-native if our specialist pollinators actually respond to them as well. But a lot of our pollinators, especially early in the season, 
when flowers are blooming, we don't actually see our herbaceous perennials blooming, but we'll often see trees blooming. So like our oaks and our maples and our willows, for instance. Well, Salix happens to be a very popular specialist pollinator plant, as well as a plant that's good for as a host species for, for other insects as well. So it's important to actually grow willows try to grow some that are native. I have some that are cultivated varieties as well that are here because they are really beautiful. And um, initially we had a willow kind of growing in the front of the, the garden that we ended up taking out because it got too unruly and it was like half variegated and half not and it looked a, a little strange. And so we kind of tossed it over there, but it and its brothers are all kind of like propagating <laughs> themselves because it's very difficult to get rid of a willow because you could just take a stem and kind of like put it in the ground and it will start to grow. And again, if I were a specialist pollinator, then I would put my bank on, on willows because willows just kind of break and propagate everywhere. So that is a really important plant. The next one on the list is uh, verbicina. And that is called wing stem. And that was another one that I wasn't really familiar with. And it is an, in the aster family as well. So that is something to take into consideration. Then there's Bidens. It's also called beggar's ticks. I know, Sandra gave me such a face. It's like so political. <laughs> yeah, it's called Bidens. It's the name of the genus. And, uh, and I don't mean that from a political standpoint. Um, it is called beggar's ticks. And the reason why it's called beggar's ticks, it has a, a bunch of like fun kind of names that uh, like Spanish needles, a number of others because of the fruits and they kind of like stick to your clothes. But again, in the aster family, um, very pretty kind of yellow and orange flowers, uh, not something that I had seen around here. So that's something that I would actually, you know, like to uh, bring to the land, maybe in the meadow. Um, it does have a little bit of horticultural value, but maybe not as, as much as, you know, wanting to put it into the, the actual pollinator garden. All right, so the last few of them is another one called Pityopsis. And this is one that, I think that there might be one that is native to New York. It would be the sickle-leaved golden aster. But this is, I guess, more prominent towards the southern part of the eastern United States. And then the other one that I think that people would probably kind of snub their nose at is Circium. This is basically your thistles. So people don't love thistles. Um, they don't tend to, to plant thistles in their fields or in their flower beds, but they, they could actually have a very stately appearance. It's just that if you rub against them, they could obviously irritate your skin or stick to your clothes, but they are actually really important for specialist pollinators. So if you see some of your thistles, now some are non-native and some are native, but if you see some of your thistles, you might actually want to leave them. And if you've ever seen thistle, especially when they're in full bloom, you will see a ton of bees on them. And then even when their seed heads are going to, like when their flowers are going to set seed, I see tons of goldfinches on them. So they really do serve like a, a good purpose, even though they may not be the, the, the nicest of plants that we would um, encourage like in our planting beds. All right, the last two would be vaccinium. And vaccinium are ericaceous. So those are the blueberries. You know, we could actually come over here and I could show you some of those. I have some, I don't have blueberries growing here. This is the lingonberry. And you could see these cute little flowers right here. And that is really compliments to the ericaceous family have these little bell-like flowers that are perfect for bumblebees. So again, this is not in the aster family. This is the other one next to Salix that's not in the asteraceae family, but really good pollinator plant. We have a ton of different types of blueberries and huckleberries and things along those lines that are here in New York state. So that is a popular one. And the final one is Heliopsis, which is, basically a false sunflower. So it looks like a sunflower, it's in the aster family, and there are some specialist pollinators that use that one as well. And we have some native Heliopsis here in New York. So those are the 15 most important genera for specialist pollinators. Those are the ones that you are going to want to cultivate in your garden if you want to bring in specialist pollinators, at least in the Eastern United States. 
And I would encourage you to look at your different regions, like I said, central or western parts of the United States will have slightly different ones, although, you know, there will be some crossover. I do know in the central and western part, Fabaceae, the family of Fabaceae, which are the legumes, are really important to specialist pollinators out there, which you don't see as much here in the eastern United States. Um, you do see some, but they're not like quite prominent as the ones that I had shared with you. So again, if you're looking to cultivate specialist pollinators, that's the way to go. And those would be the genera that I would concentrate on. Thanks for taking time to watch this video. Now you can find other videos on specialist pollinators here on this channel. And if you're enjoying our videos, consider liking, subscribing, hitting the notifications bell, and even tipping. We are reinvesting 10% of our Google AdSense revenue back into projects here in the Finger Lakes community. So your support of this channel goes a long way. We'll see you in the next video.